Well, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining today. Um, I love the Plaza workshops. I don't even know how long I've been doing them now, like a few years, probably three, four years at least. Um, I really enjoy them, uh, partly because I get to pick all of my favorite art products like a watercolor block and Derwent paint pans and Derwent pencils and put them all together and do a two hour workshop with y'all. So Thank you so much for joining. Um, nothing that I do today is going to be revolutionary by any means. It's a whole lot of watercolor techniques that I'm sure you've seen many other places and that you can find everywhere online um, on other YouTube videos. But the materials that I'm using hopefully are something new for you today. Um, so like Inktense is not traditional watercolor. It's a little bit different. And then the pencils that we're going to be using, one of them is wax, so um, so it won't blend with the water. And then the other one is actually a water-soluble pencil. And I use a lot of water-soluble pencils. Um, Derwent offers many different kinds. Graphitin is just one of them, and it's one of my favorite series that they have. So I hope that you enjoy the introduction to that. And if you do like it today, then I encourage you to really look into their other water-soluble pencils. Um, and I should probably tell you too, I'm in Cincinnati. I've been doing watercolor for, I guess, since I graduated from college in 2013. So over 10 years now. Um, and I learned to do it because I went to fashion school and, um, in fashion school, we had to communicate all of our designs using watercolor. So that's fun. That's where I learned to do traditional watercolor painting. Um, okay, Lauren, you can switch it over there okay so um real quick here is the hashtag again create with plaza art and then here is my instagram handle it's just abby nuri watercolor you can send me a message on there you can also email me at abby nuri watercolor at gmail so literally just add the at gmail there and you can reach me there Okay, so we have 14 steps today to create this. And at the end, I'm gonna show you all of the different variations. Um, I think I've painted this like eight times now and each time it turns out a little bit different. So we'll see how it turns out today. But 14 steps, um, I tried to break it down into pretty clear steps. So you guys let me know as we go if it's clear enough. I know you guys have a nine by 12 piece of paper. I have an 11 by 14 pad in front of me so that I have some space to show you some other stuff along the side. But these pencil marks right here show by my nine by 12. So just so that you guys know, I am working at the same size. And before I tape my edges, for anyone who doesn't know what a watercolor block is, um, I'm gonna show you real quick. So. You guys all have this paper at home. This is the cold press Arches uh, watercolor paper, um, but I'm using the block of it. And so blocks are great because they come and your, your paper is taped down. Um, it's my favorite way to watercolor, great for traveling. You don't have to worry about bringing masking tape with you uh, because your paper is already glued down on all sides. Now, that being said, I still like taping my edges and using masking tape so that I get that really beautiful, clean, hard finish. So whether you're using a watercolor block or you just have your single piece of paper and you're on a tabletop or maybe you have a card piece of cardboard, whatever, um, go ahead and grab your masking tape and we're just going to tape our edges down. Um, while you're doing that, Abby, we do actually have a good question for what you're working on now before she tapes it down. Jennifer is asking, can you remind me which side of the paper should I should use the rougher or smoother side? There's no watermark. Yeah, so I think that's a that is actually a great question. Um, this is a piece that I took out of another pad that I have. If I'm looking at it, the rougher side for cold press, you want to, it's, it should be the rougher side and you should be able to tell. I don't think I'll be able to show it to you on the screen, um, but the 
the rougher side looks like the correct side to me. And what I mean by that is that I know it's the rougher side that is the correct side, but honestly, it's kind of hard to discern with your eye. Um, but the rougher side, if you can tell, is the right side. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to tape my edges. Like trying my hardest not to move anything out of the screen while I do this. <clears throat> All right, step one, it's done. Your paper should be taped. So <clears throat> now I'm gonna start drawing my trees. Um, I did not share a sketch for this one um, for people to trace and that's because I think that this is definitely a scene that anyone can draw and it doesn't have to look exactly the same. In fact, if you wanna turn your paper and do a landscape painting, you can do that too. It really doesn't matter at all. Um, really, all I need you to get down is a pathway and some trees and that's it. We're gonna create everything else in the painting. So I'm gonna use my brown ochre um, Derwent Pro Color Pencil. The reason I'm using this is because I actually love to use the Pro Color series to draw. Um, again, it's a wax pencil, so the water is not going to disturb it, um, which it's different than uh, any of your graphite pencils. Like sometimes you'll find that your water actually starts to kind of smear them. Um, this pencil is going to stay put. Also, the Pro Color series is a pretty hard um, uh, colored pencil, and so you don't get a lot of dust with it. Um, and it's also a pretty thick pencil in comparison to the other ones. So yeah, I just love these. I'm going to sharpen mine. And I always choose a color that is going to blend in with my painting. So in this case, uh, it is either a yellow or an orange. I just love the brown ochre color. So I sharpened my pencil. And now I'm gonna start drawing. Now I hope you guys can see what I'm drawing. This is a pretty light colored pencil. I'm gonna push as hard as I can so that you guys can see what I'm putting down. I would encourage you to draw as light as you can because uh, in watercolor, you wanna try to not see your background drawing, but either way, we're actually gonna cover up a ton of it. So don't really worry about that. I'm gonna start with just about two thirds down Sorry if you can hear my baby crying in the background. My husband's out there watching. <laughs> um, I'm going to start about here and I'm going to draw a pathway coming toward me. And again, don't feel at all like you can make your path really curved if you want. Play around, make whatever scene you want. I'm also a very like scribbly sketcher. All right, there's my pathway. Um, I want to put like a little hill, just like, I don't know, a little hill coming in right here. So I'm just going to draw that out. I'm going to mark that right there. And then I am going to put three trees in the foreground, kind of like what I have here. A couple that are just um, in the middle ground. And then everything that's fading away, I'm not even going to draw in. So... I'm going to start by putting a tree right here. To me, these kind of look like maple trees, but also make up whatever tree you want. I'm 
And of course, if you had all day to just sit there and draw your trees, which is really nice, um, you could make these super detailed, get them really realistic. We obviously don't have time for that in our two hour class, but And don't worry about putting too many branches in, just kind of. Okay, here's my one tree. Um, I'm gonna put like this, kind of looks like a dead tree in the front. I just like the contrast to have like the really dark tree trunk in the front. That's why I'm adding this here. I'm not even going to add any texture to the ground right now. I'll just add all that later. Okay. And then over on this side, I'm going to have a tree that comes in kind of from the side here at a little bit of an angle. Okay, that feels pretty good to me. Um, I am going to loosely draw in where I want my like bunches of leaves to be. Now in these paintings, it's fall time. So a lot of the leaves have fallen. So you don't have to put too much space in there for, for the leaves, but I am just gonna kind of give myself loose outline for where I plan to put these bunches of leaves. Okay, hey, there we go. Kind of a scribbly mess of trees. Exactly as a forest should be, right? Okay, um, before I move on, so that, that was my pencil. Again, I love these for drawing. Um, they are also great because you can erase them. So if you feel like you need to erase anything, go for it. I don't know how much you guys can really see this right now, but I can completely erase what I put down. Well, maybe not completely, but a lot of it comes up. So uh, again, another reason why I like using these watercolor, or I'm sorry, why I like using these pencils for my watercolor paintings. Okay, so now we're going to start with the wet on wet technique to start adding in our background. And because it's this atmospheric painting, I want um, I want it to look like the sun is coming in from some angle. I don't really care where it is, um, but that you're walking outside in the forest on a fall day and it's just a golden hue everywhere. But I do want you to notice that I have areas where on the paper where it is completely white. I've done that on like all the versions that I've done. So as I'm wetting my paper, I'm gonna leave some areas dry. Uh, because I have this on, I put this on the suggested list, I'm going to start with using my three quarter inch brush. Um, I really like this, uh, these tips and this width for working on the backgrounds a lot of, of a lot of my paintings. If you just have this brush today, you are golden, like you're gonna do great with this one. So I'm gonna wet half of my page with my thicker brush and then I'll wet the other half with this brush just to show that I can use both. So I'm gonna start out with just my clear water. 
And I have two cups of water right now, partly just so that I don't have to go grab new water throughout the class. And also because I'm going to try my best to use one for my cooler colors. So like when we're, when I'm using the mid ultramarine, I'm going to wash my brush in one. And then when I'm using the mango um, and the burnt yellow ochre, I'm going to wash my brush in the other. So try to keep them separate if you can. It shouldn't be a huge deal. Okay, so with a wet brush, I'm just going to start wetting my whole paper. But again, I, you guys aren't going to be able to see this, but I'm leaving some areas of the paper completely dry, just like small streaks of it, okay? And I want you to get your paper pretty wet. because we're actually gonna add three different, um, we're gonna add like three different layers into this single wet layer. So use pretty much water. So again, I love, I'm gonna switch to my other brush now, but if you have this at home, keep using this, uh, this brush. Um, I just love it for backgrounds. It holds a whole lot of water and is great for just really getting your paper nice and wet. But now I'm going to switch over to this guy, which is great because you can use it for background and details. The only difference really is that it's just a slightly smaller brush. So I've got to do more stroking with it to get full coverage of the water. I'm going to kind of move through the next three steps pretty quickly because then we have a drying point. And once I get to that point, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the Inktense products themselves because there are some things that I want to highlight about them, but I'm going to wait because this part is kind of time sensitive. Okay, so now my whole page is wet, except for a couple white streaks in there. And I'm going to start with Mango which for me, I've got the whole intense set right here. Here's my mango right there. I'm gonna get that wet. Just gonna start brushing it on. And feel free to honestly put this kind of wherever you can kind of see where the, my paper is dry there because when I dragged it across it's not bleeding out which I like because I want it to be streaky and try to get variation in your coverage so like you don't want to have don't don't just like blanket the entire thing, get some variation. And as you're doing this, if you feel like any part of your paper is starting to dry, just go ahead and wet it again. Because again, for like the next three steps, we're gonna try to work in the same wet layer. And when your paint or when your paper can start to dry and then you're like re-wetting it while color is down, that's when you can start getting all these various blooms of color, which honestly isn't a bad thing, um, but it can sometimes dry in a way that you really don't expect it to. I'm just going to add a little bit more over here. Okay. That feels good to me. Um, then I'm just going to start adding the, the floor and the trees that are in the background. Um, so I'm going to start painting in this area just very, very loosely. And I'm going to start suggesting trees in the background. And I'm gonna use the red oxide and the ultramarine to do that. So depending on how much you use of each, 
Um, that's going to determine whether your painting looks more red, more blue, or more purple. Any of those are okay. I tend to mix my red oxide and my mid ultramarine, and I prefer to use more of a purple. That's where I'm getting all these purple hues from. Um, so over here, here is my mid ultramarine right here. I'm gonna pull some of that out. I'm just kind of mixing it on the side here. And then my red oxide is right here. Okay, now I've got like this really nice, deep, bluish, purpley color. Now, I wanna make sure that I don't have too much water. It's like I still have pretty much water on my paper. So make sure you don't have too much water in your brush, otherwise it's really gonna blend out. You wanna have some control of this, but not, not too much, like it should still be loose. Um, so I'm just gonna start over here. Just gonna start putting some texture in everywhere. Um, you can even kind of go over your tree trunks, that's fine. Be really loose. You can even kind of mix your colors on your paper. So don't feel like you have to like, I'm just gonna grab a little bit of this. Okay, and then I'm going to come over here to the other side. I'm leaving my my uh, walking path. Um, I'm not going to get any purple or red or blue, whatever color you're highlighting the most. I'm going to try to keep that off of there. And as you come to the foreground, that's where you want your colors to be more intense. You can be really abstract with this, like just put some texture down, don't blend it all together. It'll kind of mix as it dries. Um, if you do get anything down on the paper at this point that you don't love, actually I'm fine with all this, but I will show you if you have a towel with you, you can dab some of it up. Um, okay. So Abby, now this is sorry, yeah. if you have just a stopping point real quick, can you show the finished piece you're referencing real quick on camera? Yeah. Right here. No, and I'll pull it again in just a second. Okay. Um, so cool. we're gonna, this next part, you gotta do pretty quick before your background dries. So at this point, you should have your red, your ultramarine, your purple hues down here. Now what I want you to do is take your brush, have a little bit of pigment on there, not too much, and you're gonna start pulling some tree trunks up in the background. Now, some of these are gonna completely disappear on you. Some of them are gonna to remain to the end. Um, that's good. You, you These should, they're gonna dry and they're just gonna blend away. And that's how you're gonna get the depth in your painting. You can also start to call out your trees that are closer. One of the dif difficult things about watercolor is learning to control the amount of water versus the amount of pigment that you're using. And I will say that this painting that we're doing today is a little bit difficult for that. So if you find, if you're if you're pretty new to watercolor and you're already getting a little frustrated or you feel like you 
put your brush down and suddenly all this pigment came out. Um, don't get frustrated. Definitely just look at this as a learning opportunity because what we're doing right now, I would say is actually the hardest thing about watercolor. And the tricky thing is that once you do put these colors down onto your paper, you can't really get them all, which is a beautiful thing and also a very challenging thing. Um, I will, you can do this too. So maybe you have like a little pine tree, an evergreen back there. My paper's still wet. Um, Abby, Mark is asking, is the block you are working on at an angle or flat? It's flat. Now, I will say if, if I knew everybody had a block and we could like turn the paper around, I would have us uh, angle it differently. But because I know that not everybody can do that, uh, I'm keeping mine flat right now. Good question though. And I'm just gonna come over here and I'm gonna call out my other, I'm gonna start uh, defining my other tree. It's funny because I'm like looking at the screen while I'm painting, which is kind of nice. I like doing this. Okay, I'm going to add a couple more trees to my background way back there. Okay, and now uh, your page should still be somewhat wet. Um, I am going to where where I outlined uh, the area that I am planning to put like my little leave bundles, um, I'm going to try and control the addition of some burnt yellow ochre in those areas so that what I'm gonna get is a very nice blend of color that I can build on later. But like these areas, that's what I'm gonna try to achieve right now. Not the detail, obviously, we build that on later but just getting these nice like blooms of color into the, into the background. So burnt yellow ochre, which for me is right here. And your paper should cut, like some of that water should be drying up by now. So it's still bleeding out for me. Again, you don't wanna do too much. You can very quickly like take over this painting um, and this scenery with too much pigment. So make sure you don't do that. Like that's enough for right there. I'm gonna do right here. Parts of my page are actually starting to dry, but parts are still wet so that I'm getting like a nice blend and a nice texture. Like I said in the beginning, this should be like a really atmospheric painting. It can be almost abstract. I, I think the most important thing about today is just learning to uh, blend the Derwent Ink Tense paint pans and getting familiar with how they work and how they blend together. Um, I'm gonna add a little bit more here. come over here now for me um this area right here is really dry so i'm just gonna add a little bit of water because i've got a big leaf bundle there and i don't want to just apply wet pigment to my dry paper yet
And while you're doing this too, if you want to brighten up any of your areas with, um, like I'm going through and I'm using my brown or my burnt yellow ochre, but you can also get creative and add some other bright colors in there if you want, like some mango. Um, just be careful, don't add too much yet. I'll show you in a minute what'll happen if I add some fuchsia in there. At this point, some of your background might be hard to see. That's a good thing because um, you want those pencil lines to blend away, but mine are getting kind of difficult for me to see at this point. Okay, so uh, before I add a little bit more color up there, I'm gonna come down to my uh, path, which should still be wet for you. And I'm gonna use some uh, burnt yellow. I'm gonna start shading this just a little bit right around here and right along this area. And pull some color across. I think one of the hardest things to learn about watercolor too is knowing when to stop. We can really want to just keep adding color. Um, and a lot of times less is more. I have to remind myself of that. And again, as it gets closer to the foreground, that's where I want to see more color, more vibrancy. While it's wet, if you really want to have fun, you can even do like a little splatter in there. It'll kind of blend out. I don't even know if you guys can see what I just did. We're gonna do that again later too. So don't worry too much about that right now. And I'm gonna add just a little bit of shadowing here. Okay. And then one more thing before I move on, um, I am going, actually two more things. So this is still wet for me up here, just to show you what happens if I wanna get a little bit more color up in my leaves, just we're gonna add that again later anyway, but um, since this is like the base layer, I, I guess, I don't know how vibrant that looks to you on the screen right now, but um, it looks, I'm just adding a little bit of mango and it's adding just like a punch of color to my background. Not too much. Just a couple little dabs in each one. Okay, now one thing you can see starting to happen in mine. Um, so because this was drying down here and then I added some pigment and water you can see how, I think people call this like a cauliflower effect. Um, it basically means that my paper wasn't wet enough when I was adding more color. So you can see how that started to blend out there. I can try to fix that and blend it out just by adding more water and blending there. Okay, so that is the first layer and now we're gonna let that dry. I do have a hair dryer that I would use um, and that I will use if mine doesn't dry in the next few minutes while I explain some things about ink tents. First of all, Lauren, were there any other questions? Uh, Cause I know those were like some fast steps and now we're at a drying period. So are there any questions that came up that I can answer? Nope, not as of yet. Okay, great. So keep working, 
listen to me if you want to, you don't, if you don't want to. Um, ink tense is different than traditional watercolor. Um, it's obviously water soluble in the same way, but the great thing about these that you have to learn to work with, but it, it truly is a great thing once you get familiar with it, um, they are permanent once dry. So the beauty of the painting that we're doing today is that we're gonna put a layer down and then that layer is gonna be completely permanent as opposed to, to traditional watercolor where you can put down a layer and then if you keep adding color and water to it, it can, the layers can start to blend and muddy even when they are completely dry. Um, so you're not gonna have that problem. Now, some people like that, like, like that, that they can blend throughout layers and with traditional watercolor, you can put down a dry layer and sometimes you can add water and then kind of pick up some of your color. You can't really do that with ink tents. Um, once they're down, they're down and you can't remove them. So different, but not completely. I use these a lot with, along with my traditional watercolors. Um, I use them for a lot of backgrounds and I use them to add more vibrant color to a lot of my watercolor paintings because honestly, I think of all of the water soluble products that I have, ink tents are the most vibrant. Um, so that's that. I encourage you to get either the, like if, if this is your first introduction to them and you have the five little paint pans today, um, if you do really like them, I encourage you to get either the, uh, they have two different sets of 12 and then I have the studio paint pan set, which is the full set of 24. And then they also come in pencil form and the pencil form, I think they have like a set of 72 or even 136. Um, so you can get a lot of colors there. But anyway, that is Ink Tense. I've been using them for a very long time. And They're also great to um, travel with. Abby, uh, we do have an attendee who is asking, they're curious about Ink Tense blocks and if yeah. it's the same as the watercolor pans and how those work as well. Yeah, um, I would actually, maybe at the end, if I have time, I can actually pull some down. I love those. <laughs> um, they do work the same, meaning like if you just got the ink tense blocks, you can actually have them set up next to you like this right now and just use them the exact same way because they, they come in like these little wells and then you can pick them up like a piece of chalk or you can just leave them in there and literally use them like you would here. Um, they also come in many more colors. I know that there's a set of 72 of those. There might even be one with more colors. Um, they're really, they're, they're very fun, very cool. And you can draw right onto your paper and then apply water. So um, they're really versatile. I definitely encourage you to get those. I think when it comes to the pencils versus the blocks, if you're a person who really likes to work in like minute detail, then I would encourage you to get the pencils first. I think if you're a person who's like, I just want to fill space and get messy, definitely go for the blocks. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and dry mine with my little hair dryer here. And while I'm doing this, um, do the same, and you want this layer to be completely dry before moving on, okay?
So, Abby, while you're doing that, I don't know if you can hear. No, I think we'll wait till she's done. <laughs> Okay. Lauren, can you hear me? I keep getting yes. these funny messages pop up, like if I want to set up professional audio with the hair <laughs> on. So I just wanted to make sure you could actually hear me again. <laughs> yes, you're good. Okay. We did get a couple questions while you were air drying. Yes. So Erica is asking, just want to make sure I'm understanding when they dry, they won't be activated again. Um, yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So basically like you can't remove them. You can't like everything on here now, it, this layer is permanent. And then do you have any tips of alternative ways to dry your painting faster if you don't have a hair dryer? Um, turn on an overhead fan or I, if you're in the Midwest, I think we're having a drought, open a window. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, no. If I will say this, if you don't have a hair dryer right now, and two choices: one, you can move on with us, and if you get a little bit of blending color, and that's okay. Um, but also, this is recorded, right, Lauren? And they're going to have access to it later. So if you want to wait for your for your paper to dry, um, you could even just do swatches on the side right now. I know that it is frustrating to wait for paper to dry, and, and I'm sorry, but that is just part of watercolor. Um, but if your paper is pretty dry, you can probably move on with us right now because we're actually going to wet part of it again and then start adding some color. Okay, great. Marion also suggested blowing on it a bit worked. <laughs> yeah, that, and it depends too, like how much water you added. Sometimes, um, sometimes my paper ends up drying pretty fast. Okay. So we are on step seven of 14 now. So we're gonna start adding, we're, we're just gonna start um, popping out these leaves a little bit more. I'll show you guys that example. And then this example, this is kind of a more fuchsia heavy um, and much darker ground using the blue and red oxide. Um, so just showing you guys these two different examples to choose your own adventure as we keep moving. But what we're gonna do is we're just gonna start working on like these uh, these leaf bundles that I keep calling them, technical term, leaf bundles. Um, so I am going to do the wet on wet technique again. And for this part, I'm gonna use the mango, the burnt yellow ochre and the fuchsia. And I'm gonna start on this side since I'm right-handed. So I'm not gonna put my water everywhere. I'm just gonna put it in the areas where I want to have, have my leaves. So I know that I want them up here. And I'll kind of do these like one at a time so that, um, one, so that it, as I go, the last one is drying, um, but two, so that you guys can, can see each step that I'm doing. Okay, so I just kind of have this big nebulous blob of water on my paper. And now I'm gonna grab some mango. Just kind of blotting it on. I really want texture, so I'm not gonna, you know, just, uh, I'm not gonna do like a blanket sw uh, swipe. Definitely gonna blot it. And I also wanna create some dimension. So I kind of want the leaves underneath here to be a little bit more in shadow and the leaves that would be on top to be being hit by the sun. So I started with my mango. Now I'm gonna go, I'm gonna grab some, um, I keep forgetting the names of these, the burnt yellow ochre. I'm gonna add some of that in. And then my favorite part, I'm gonna grab some fuchsia. Just get those red pinkish leaves that you see in the forest. I'm 
Now we're gonna do more layers of these. So again, don't go too heavy or else you're gonna get way too much by the end. Keep it pretty light, like that's good. And then I'm gonna move on to my next one. So actually I wanna put a little bit of one up here. Just gonna grab some of that mango. Then the burnt yellow ochre. And not everyone has to have, you know, as much depth and detail. So as I get moving faster here, you'll see that um, you can do this either very detailed or very quick and, and sketchy. Lauren, feel free to hit me with any questions that come in right now, because this is very much just like a, I'm just going to keep painting right now, moment. Nothing right now. Abby, this is Jessica. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, when you are doing these, I know you've done several sketches in advance and you were going to show some of those later, but mm -hmm. do you swatch out some of your colors in advance to sort of get an idea of which, what you want to build with? Um, pick a yeah. Palette? So actually if we were working with like the whole palette, that's a great question. I definitely would have done that so that people could see the different colors. Um, but yes, I, I, I actually hope that we have time at the end because I want to show like uh, this intense palette comes with so many warm hues here that probably uh, to the people at home look pretty similar, but they look really different when you put them down. Um, so yes, yes, I do. Okay, now if you want to add just like a little bit more, um, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, just a little bit more wild, unplanned leaves to your nature or to your, to your forest scene, feel free to do a little splatter. So I just have water and pigment on my brush right now. And while that's wet, I'm just going to splatter and some of it's getting outside of my wet area. It's just adding a little bit of texture. Look, I just saw a question of what color. Um, I used mango and the uh, burnt yellow ochre. I don't know how much you guys can see it here. I'll hold it up. So when I did that, I just got like those little dots. Um, I can see a lot more of them. I don't think it's showing up on the screen, but it's just giving me a little bit more texture to that layer. Okay, so now I'm gonna come over to my other side of my painting. I'm gonna do the same thing. I 
And you can make your trees like a little bit different colors if you want to. Maybe one has more fuchsia than the other. What I don't think you guys can see over to the side here is how much I'm wetting and then like blotting my brush. Um, so like right now I have it in the water and then I always come back over here and I blot it a little bit. That can be a helpful thing to know. Um, again, learning to control the amount of water on your brush. Like you don't want it to be too much, but you don't want it to be too little. That can be a very difficult thing. You should see that you're starting to get some form and detail in your trees. Almost done, get there. And again, I know this is a step where like, if you had a whole lot of time to sit here, we could add so much detail. Obviously in this class, we're not super focused on that, but if you wanna continue on on this step, um, and keep working on this layer, you certainly can, and then move on to the next one later when you rewatch the video. Abby, this is Jessica again. I was wondering when you're coming up with imagery for this and coming up with ideas, are you doing any sort of um, uh, studies in, in trees? Are you, are you working from images or are um, you just doing it from... So for this one, I, it, it varies. Um, one time I did, like, I think one of my favorite plaza art classes that I did was uh, root vegetables in the fall time. Oh, yes, with the carrots. Oh, my gosh, I loved that one. And I, I like, went out and, like, bought carrots and, and beets. And um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I always do some type of study. For this one... I referenced a bunch of photos of my parents' cabin in Wisconsin. They're just, they have a cabin surrounded by a whole bunch of trees on the lake and that was it. Um, but it's definitely like a made up scene. Great, thank you. Really, the only thing I referenced it for was getting an idea of uh, a, a trail and kind of what a tree looks like but even that I want to draw whatever tree I want I take the Bob Ross approach to a lot of these things
Also, I think it's fun to come up with a scene. Like one thing that I like about these plaza watercolor workshops is that because you guys give out a kit, um, you do have to limit yourself. I mean, I know you can go beyond what the kit has in it, but I like to create a painting that anybody can do with just the kit. And I think it's fun to come up with a scene that only needs five colors. So, um, okay, so I have my leaves fairly laid out and I'm gonna add some detail to the ground, some sticks and texture while that dries. Um, I'm gonna use the red oxide, the ultramarine and the burnt yellow. So this guy's drying. Um, and this is what I'm talking about. I wanna add like just some wild grasses. Um, I want it to look like I there are maybe some leaves that have fallen along the path. Um, and as you're doing this, again, remember to keep your detail in the front. And then as it moves away into the background, you want that detail to fade. I am gonna add a little bit of shadowing back there. And we'll do that using uh, the wet on dry technique, okay? So this is dry for me down here and I want I don't know how well you guys can see this. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start by doing wet on dry. Um, when I do, so when you have a rough, a fairly rough paper, which we do, there's a rougher version of, of watercolor paper, um, but the cold press is like the in-between. Hot press is the smooth, the smoothest one you can get. Um, if you have a rough paper though, you can use your brush and a little bit of water and pigment and you can create texture just using the texture of your paper, which I'm gonna show you right now because that's what I wanna do back here. I just wanna like create a little bit of roughness on the ground. Um, so I'm gonna mix a little bit of my red oxide and my mid ultramarine. And the trick here is that you don't want too much um, water on your brush. You also don't want too much pigment pigment because then it's just going to be too dark. So grab your test piece of paper off to the side and try this out. So I'm going to look, kind of lay my brush down almost on its side. And I'm going to do that. And you can see how it's just the only reason it's doing that is because of the texture of the paper. So I'm gonna come back here. You can, all, I, I don't, you guys might be able to hear it even kind of like scraping across the paper. I just saw a question of what colors did I blend? It was mid ultramarine and red oxide. So I hope you can see how that just added like a little bit of textured layer there. I'm gonna get a little bit more. I'm gonna keep doing that. So again, this part of my paper down here is dry. And as I get closer to the foreground, I'm gonna get it darker. Okay. And again, I don't know how this one's gonna turn out. This one, I was super dark and purple with the ground. I feel like I'm leaning more toward that today. This was like a little bit more brown, kind of lighter. But what I'm gonna do now over here is add some of these just grasses. Um, and then I'm also going to just start calling out like the bottom of the, the tree trunks. So I have been tending to, for this next step, I use a lot of red oxide, and then I'm also gonna use a little bit of the burnt yellow ochre. But again, if you, it, maybe you really like blue, you can, you can do more blues in this part if you want to. But I've got red oxide, I'm mixing it 
right here in with what I already had down. So there is a little bit of mid ultramarine there. And I'm just gonna get real messy and start adding some grass and plants. I don't know what kind of plants, doesn't matter. And this is where one of my trees is coming up from right here. I'm just going to loosely, not too dark, bring that up. Here's another one that I have coming up. Um, so another cool thing about the ink tents, I'm gonna call this tree out right here. And that's like the last one that I'm gonna call out or define. I keep saying call out, define is what I mean. Um, so another cool thing about ink tents is that you can uh, layer some of your lighter colors onto your darker colors a little bit. Um, so I'm going to grab some of my burnt yellow ochre and I just want to, I don't know if you guys, I'll, I'll hold it up in a second so that you can see the color that's coming out on top. I mean, you can kind of see it there, I think on the screen that I'm looking at. Okay, and then I'm just going to kind of leave that for now. I'm going to come over to my other side. I'm getting some red oxide on my brush, a little bit of mid ultramarine. And then I'm going to start again with that wet on dry paper technique. And I have a little hill right here. So I'm gonna put a shadow to define that. I'm gonna kind of make it look like there are some trees that are casting a shadow this way over here. And then just get kind of rough. And then at this step, um, don't do this too dark, but you can do it at this point. So this tree right here, I'm gonna pull a shadow. I don't wanna mess this up. I'm gonna pull a shadow all the way across. And I'm gonna do the same thing for this guy. Leave and I don't have enough pigment on my brush right now. There we go. I had some other little streaks coming across. Um, and then I'm also going to grab some uh, burnt yellow. And as I go back on the trail, I'm gonna do the same thing, but I don't want those uh, shadows to be quite as dark. And I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to add some more of those grasses like I did over here. So I'm grabbing some red oxide.
Um, I do love this brush that we're using for this whole thing because you can get a really good point on it. So when I add, I'm going to add like some grasses coming over the, the uh, pathway. Okay, and then I'm gonna get just a little bit more of that purpley color and just define the edge of my path a little bit more right here, almost like the, um, the path kind of dips down and this is all the, whatever, the foliage that's like growing over the path. So I want a little bit of a shadow there. Okay, now um, I want it to look like I have some leaves that have fallen down here. So I'm gonna use my burnt yellow ochre and I'm mixing everything in the same spot. So technically I guess I'm getting a little bit of all my color. I'm not a very clean mixer. Some people are very like, uh, they, they just have a much cleaner palette than I do. I never do. I tend to just end up mixing all my colors together. So I'm gonna kind of like this brown, red brown. And then you can just add some little leaves. Make sure you don't have too much. I'm just gonna go like that. Kind of turn my brush. Just make sure you don't get too much pigment. And you can also at this stage um, splatter some more. I just want a whole lot of texture building up on my walking path. And then I'm gonna add some more lighter leaves as I go back. Okay, I'm going to take stock and look at what I got here. We're going to come down and add some more detail to this later. I do want to come over to this area right now because I feel like um, obviously if I actually had shadows going across this, there would be leaves as part of the shadows too. So I'm going to get a little bit more of my uh, purpley color that I was using before. So mid ultramarine and red oxide. I'm going to mix it up over here. Just keep it very light. 
That's the color. That's how light it is. And then I'm just going to kind of literally like scribble. So that if I had branches coming off my trees, they would be there. And then I can splatter a little bit too. Okay, I'm gonna leave that for now. I'm gonna come back up here. Um, your leaves should be pretty dry. Mine are not completely dry, but I think, I think they're dry enough. We're gonna start adding detail to the tree trunks um, and all the branches. So we're gonna come into here and here and here. And we're first gonna do that using our brush. And then we're gonna come back and we're gonna do it with the pencil. Um, so I'm gonna start with the wet on dry paper technique again. So don't wet anything on here. Just grab your brush, mix up whatever color you prefer for your uh, branches of your tree. You could use just red oxide if you want to. I'm gonna do the purple again, the red oxide and ultramarine. And make sure that if any of this is wet down here, don't lay your hand in it. Um, it's also always a challenge. Mine seems pretty dry, so I'm not gonna worry about it right now. So I'm gonna start over here and I just have, this is how, that's how dark mine is right now. I'm gonna try to keep a pretty good point on my brush as I do this. Um, I don't wanna turn my paper, but. So you're just gonna start doing that and adding definition wherever it makes sense on your painting. Don't feel like you have to follow what I'm doing here. And also this shouldn't be your darkest dark yet. And you should be able to go right over where you loosely defined these in the beginning. You might have some trees that are kind of in the foreground that you can also call out. So this, what looks like a dead tree to me right now, that's back there, I'm gonna try to to find that one a little bit too as I go. Hopefully you're getting what I'm getting here, which is you can tell that this tree in the front is definitely coming out to us more and these are starting to fade away. I'm mixing more color over here.
Like, I don't even know. I don't know. I'm making up branches right now. You can kind of pull some of your branches out. Um, you can start loosely defining some that would kind of become, like you might not have them drawn there right now, but you can just start adding some little sticks into your trees. And maybe you have some that are coming all the way up here. Fill your whole composition. You can get really dark down in here where your tree's coming up. And then also while I'm down here, um, I'm gonna add a little, just a little tiny tree that's growing up there. Maybe there's, I don't know, log on the ground. Okay. I'm mixing up a little bit more color here. And you can see in these that there's shadowing, like I went over my trees in the foreground multiple times with um, different amounts of pigment so that I actually got some shadowing on the tree trunks themselves. Now we're gonna do some of that once we use our graph tint pencil, but I am gonna go back right now and add even a little bit more because like these can even get some more dimension. So I've mixed up more pigment over here. And hopefully when I do this, you'll see um, even more dimension starting. So I'm just continuing to layer at this point. And again, this is something obviously we could we could sit here all day and do this. Okay. That feels I'm gonna add a little bit here. All right, that feels pretty good to me right now. Um, I'm going to start, I'm going to go to the other side. And I know that I'm, I have about a half hour left, so I might speed up a little bit, but you guys should take your time. Lauren, have we had any questions come in? No, everyone's real quiet. I think very okay. involved in their work right now. Okay, it's funny because everyone is so quiet that for a minute there I kind of forgot <laughs> <laughs> that I'm painting with like 95 people yeah. right now, however many are in here. <laughs> I 
I do like this painting because you can create like any scene that you want and you can get just kind of lost in it. And just sit here and keep painting your trees. Jennifer says, can't wait to use the port color graphitant. <laughs> Ooh, me neither. I do. I love graphitant pencils. I also hope, so one of the reasons that I chose this scene, well, one, because it feels so fall and who doesn't love fall, but two, um, I actually find it really challenging to paint forest scenes. Like I, I, there's like so much detail in them that they're overwhelming to me. And so I like to challenge myself to paint them to just like, not worry so much about all the details, but rather just kind of capture the scene. And now I really do like to go out in nature and just give myself like 20 minutes to just capture whatever I can capture. So my hope today is that doing this uh, sketch that we're doing will provide somebody the confidence to be able to go out and do this in real life. this fall. All right, over here is where I want this big tree right in the foreground. So I'm just gonna go right over top of those leaves. It's scary when I do this. Better like it, right? Because again, that ink tent is not gonna come up that I just put down. I do really love this brush that I'm using right now. Okay, I have a branch coming off of here. Or maybe you'll do this and then you'll get inspired to do like a haunted forest scene. I did that last year too, and that was really fun. That sounds fun. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna add some shadowing to this tree. Okay, that's, it, it has to feel good. I would keep going, but this has to feel good to me at this point. All right, um, next. Okay, so this is one of my favorite parts of this whole uh, workshop. So if you, uh, so on the list, um, it was said that you should have a sponge. If you don't, it's okay, don't worry, you don't need the sponge today. But I will say this, if you ever purchase any of Derwent's paint pan sets, they come with a sponge that looks like this. And usually I think in this one, it's like right there maybe, I don't know. It's there so that you can dry off your brush if you're like outside painting and you have these, which is great. Um, but I don't use it for that because I always have a towel with me. I use it for other, very like using any textures, uh, besides a watercolor brush is fun um, in watercolor painting. Um, so I actually cut these so that I can get some other textures. So I'm going to show you guys how I just cut the ends of this. I'm just going to fold this in half. Got my scissors. If you end up cutting off a chunk of your little sponge, don't worry about it. Actually, I'm just gonna do one at a time. Uh, I'm gonna do two this way. And then I'm gonna turn it this way. So you can see I've got two cuts there. And then I'm gonna do one this way. Just 
much. Now I've got six little tiny sponge pieces. Also, if you, uh, I, I've seen many other watercolor artists do this. Um, you can buy like, you know, natural sponges that have really great texture to them online. You can get real creative with sponges and texture in watercolor. But I figured a lot of people would have access to these little guys. All right. So now I've got my sponge all cut into little pieces there and I'm going to create leaves like these. So over here is where I was mixing color for this part. Um, and I'm gonna use burnt yellow fuchsia and red oxide. So I'm getting some water in my brush and you need a lot of pigment for this. I don't know if you guys can tell, but my burnt yellow is really low right now because I've done this so many times. So you want a lot of pigment because your sponge is really going to soak it up. I'm going to put that over here. If you just have like an extra piece of paper right now, just mix your color on that. Okay, I have pretty much over there. Um, now I'm going to get some fuchsia and I'm not gonna mix it all together. I'm gonna like, I'm gonna put the fuchsia over here. And then I'm getting some red oxide. Now there is a finesse to this. Like sometimes I try to do this and there's just way too much pigment on my sponge and I ruin the painting. I'll show you guys some of those at the end. Um, Sometimes I do it and it works out beautifully. So if you do it once and you ruined your painting, I'm so sorry, but it's okay because it's a learning opportunity. Um, and I might ruin mine with you right now. All right, I'm gonna hold it pretty close to the end. That's how I'm holding it because I want my little cut sponge ends to kind of like uh, go out. I don't know what word I'm trying to use. Okay, and then I'm gonna get some of this over here. I'm gonna turn it. I want different colors on different pieces of the sponge. And before you go to your painting, just kind of play with it over here on your test paper. So you can see how I can get texture. That is gonna be way too heavy, don't do that. Um, and if you feel like your pigment is just too dark, you can also just dip this in your water a little bit and that's gonna, um, that's gonna lighten up your color a little bit. So keep doing this on your test sheet until you feel good about it. You can also dab it on your towel, okay? So like I can dab over here, dab on my towel, get some of that off. And I feel good about this, not that. So hopefully you can tell that that's a little bit lighter than that. All right, um, this painting I used, I was really heavy on the burnt yellow ochre. This one, I was really heavy on the fuchsia. Today, I'm doing more red oxide. Choose your own adventure, do whatever you feel good about. Now, remember, just don't get too heavy with this. You can pull it out into your areas that aren't necessarily, like into the white areas. There you go. So I'm just gonna keep going. And I'm gonna go kind of fast. You take all the time you want, but I'm trying to get through this step because you know that I'm reaching my time limit.
And as it gets lighter, like as you're, so I don't know if you could tell what I did there, but like my, um, uh, my pigment is slowly like I'm using it up. Right. And so as I use it up, I can actually start adding some lighter layers kind of to the, that, that wouldn't really be in the foreground. Okay. So here we go. I'm getting more pigment on my sponge and I'm going to make sure that I dab it out over here. I think as you go, you'll get way more comfortable with this, but it definitely takes a minute. And suddenly I have all this beautiful texture. You can like keep adding it. Ooh, like I like what happened there. This still feels a little bit flat to me up here. And then since I have a little bit of pigment on my sponge right now, I'm just going to dip it into my water ever so slightly. And then I've got a nice... So you can just like add so many layers in there with this. I love this. It's like my favorite part. All right. For now, that's going to feel good to me. I'm going to come over to the other side. I'm going to do it real fast. Again, you guys take as much time as you want. We just have two more steps after this. You might notice too, as your intense dries, it should get a little bit lighter, just like with any watercolor. I have to get a little bit more. Actually, I'm going to go really heavy on the burnt yellow right now. Cecilia says this paint is absolutely brilliant. And I it agree. Is. It's it looking really magical right now. Mm. <laughs> Oh, I thought, I thought you meant like the actual like paint itself. I, cause I was going to say, yes, this, I love working with this, but I also can't wait to see everybody's painting because I just love atmospheric scenes like this. I think they're so pretty and they're also so challenging. Well, I find them challenging. I don't know. Maybe other people don't get all worked up about them like I do, but I just think it's, it's a lot to think about all these layers and Okay, honestly, I would keep going a little bit more with this, but because we're down to 17 minutes and I really wanna to get to the Graphitant pencil, um, I'm gonna move on. Uh, before this class, I was telling um, Lauren that I was concerned that actually I wouldn't fill the time, but that is not the case. <laughs> okay, so your Graphitant pencil. Um, these come in sets of Ooh, I think six, 12, 24, maybe not six. It might be 12, 24. I, I don't know, but they, they come in a really, really, I know I have the set of 24 and it's a great set. I use them all the time. Um, they're very like, uh, so it's pigment mixed with graphite. So you get like this 
very like ever so slightly shine at the end um and they're beautiful for natural scenes because they almost looked they look they look washed out they remind me of like sand and seashells with the slight shiny finish um i'm just gonna sharpen mine and i'm gonna use this in one particular way today which is where i wet my paper and then i apply a dry pencil to the paper there are other ways for you to use these. Um, like you can put dry pencil down and then you can actually activate it. Like that, okay? That's not how we're gonna use it today though. So this should all be pretty dry for you. I love these for adding detail because um, you don't have to use a brush you have the control that you would with, with any pencil. The other thing is you can wet parts of your paper and then when you apply your dry pencil, the pigment's gonna stay right where you put it. So I am grabbing some water, only use water that is like pretty clear right now. Um, so I'm just gonna wet this whole area, okay? But I'm only going to apply this to the branches. Okay, now I am going to hold this up for you guys so that you can see it because I feel like when I look at the screen, you guys aren't getting the full effect of this. But basically, it's like a way for me to sketch onto wet paper. And then it'll just stay there. And I just think it's so much easier. I've been using a brush all the time. Um, okay, I don't know how much you guys can see this. Hopefully you can see the difference in this versus this down here. I hope you can. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to keep going with this. So that's what I'm going to use this for in this. So you, I can quickly add other little branches here. And again, you're only going to want to do this on the wet part of your paper. So I'm going to wet this. And they have a pretty strong pencil tip. So you can like sharpen these. Get a really, really sharp tip and really start adding some minute detail into your paintings. So um, I could have really just done all of my uh, tree trunks using the pencil if I wanted to. I also really enjoy like the, it, it's um, when you use this on wet paper, it goes down so smoothly. Um, so I don't know if anyone is experiencing that or finding satisfaction in that, but I do. I think you guys will be able to see a good comparison on this one. Yeah, uh, Teresa's commenting that your pencil looks darker than the one in the kit, almost black. I wonder if it's just the screen 
Because it might be the screen. Cord. It might also be the way that I've layered. Um, ooh, okay. maybe you can see it is actually like a reddish purple, uh, which I feel like you can kind of see there. Yes. Also, once it dries, it'll probably be a little bit lighter. But I think what you might be seeing, the screen might be just showing more of a comparison between my lighter layer and now the darker layer that I'm putting down. Okay. They did get port, right? Yes, they did. All of your Graphitan pencils though that come, they're all pretty, none of them are like really, really light. Um, they're much more of a neutral set. Actually, I'm gonna... So I think that that feels like a good, when I look at the screen, that looks like a good, good example of like how I was able to add more detail here. And I did it pretty quickly and I can now go to the rest of my painting and do it. Oh man, I'm in the last 10 minutes. Oh no, oh no. If anyone has questions, please go for it. Ask me anything. Our last step was gonna be that I was gonna add a little bit more texture just to the ground. I don't really think that we necessarily need it though, but I was just gonna go back in with some uh, some of that burnt yellow ochre and just add some more punchy warmth to the ground. And then of course, I wanna see everybody's painting. And we need to take up the tape on the sides because that's like the most satisfying part of any watercolor painting. All right, I'm gonna quickly add a layer to this. I also love that like you can add like some texture. Um, so, uh, like the circles that you see like on the sides of trees. You can do that with your pencil. Julie said, yay, the pencil corrected the tree trunk I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, Jennifer is saying not specifically related to this, but I love your cards for canine series. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, I paint a lot of pets. That's what I did after I graduated. And I still do them all the time. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I think I'm going to have to call that done real quick, just because this was one of my steps. Here's what I would do down here. Um, this is just bent, burnt yellow ochre. And I just want to add just some brightness down here, nothing, whatever. Scribble some yellow down in there. And then this little hill right here just needs some something there. Suddenly we have dimension, okay. Look at that scene. All right, I'm gonna peel this up and then um, Lauren, I wanna see, once I get this up, I wanna see everybody else's. Sure, We ha I have um, just two things I wanna note from the chat. Um, Cecilia is asking, so maybe after we do gallery view, if you are able to, she's asking if we could see more examples of your work. Oh, yeah, oh, you mean these, right? Perhaps anything. Um, yeah, I can. Yeah, actually, yes, I can show you. Yeah. And, um, Joanna's asking the pro color pencil is not for watercolor. No. Yeah. But to the pro color pencil, that's a wax based pencil. That's actually like um, if you're a traditional. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, like a color pencil artist which I am not, that is, that takes far too long for me. But um, if you are into using color pencils, I wish I had the patience, definitely check out the pro color pencils. I use them. I have a set that I use for drawing. 
um, because I like that the, the Pro Color pencils specifically are made to be a really hard pencil. You don't get all that dust that you do with other graphite pencils and other colored pencils. And so then I can add water and watercolor on top of that pencil and it's not like blending everywhere, if that makes sense. I just prefer them for drawing. Cool, awesome. Um, so if everyone's ready, we'd love to see all of your work. If you wanna change to your, your view to gallery view, you can see everyone's- um, Oh, do I have to change here? How do I? So you can see it. That's the best way because you can see everyone's camera cameras at the same time. So if you want to okay. share, Ooh. turn your camera on, share your piece. Oh my gosh, I love these. So pretty. Wow. Wow. Okay, also before this, I was telling Lauren that I, I never know if I'm doing a good job of explaining. So I'm so happy to see this right now. Um, these are gorgeous. These are absolutely gorgeous. And I'm also seeing many trees that are far more accurate than mine. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, these are really beautiful. Thank you so much, you guys. Very cool. Very cool. How fun. It's a fall day on my gallery right now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I am I'm happy also, to stick around and I can show some other work um, for sure. I can also run through some other versions of these. How much time do we have, Lauren? Uh, a few minutes. We have five minutes till three. Okay. Um, so first of all, I will show just real quick the different variations of these, which it was fun to see everybody's there because there was definitely uh, like some had more brown tones, some had more purple tones, some were red, some were blue. Um, I've done this painting so many times now, and that was probably, that was my lightest one. Let me Let's see what I'm showing you guys. Okay. This was my lightest one, which was probably my personal favorite. Like you can see that the one that I did today was even darker. Um, this one was super purple. This one got even darker. And this, uh, that was the first one that I did. I'm not even gonna show you guys these. Those look like haunted forests. But this was the first one that I did. So you can see also how I got much better at the sponge technique because this one looks like I literally took a sponge and put it down on paper. Um, fast forward to that, which looks way more organic. So same painting, many different ways to do it. Um, the thing that I can show you guys, actually here, I have two things I can show you. One is this dog painting that I just finished. Oh. I love, there's that guy. So cute. Um, and this is actually another project that I'm working on for Derwent. Uh, there are a bunch of birds. These are the two things that are sitting out right now. Um, and this background was done with, I was working on a video um, using their spritzer, which is really great. I don't know if I- I think we have that. Yeah, yeah, I would think, I feel like you fun would. Tool. Um, yeah, it's a really fun tool. And the thing that's cool about this is that um, somebody asked about the intense blocks earlier. So this is actually intense blocks. Like I used a, an X-Acto blade and you just, kind of grind it and put it into the spritzer and then you can spray it. Um, you can also do that with their watercolor pencils um, with the intent paints. Um, yeah, any of them. And then these were both done with watercolor pencils. So a lot of variation, but yeah. Um, one last thing, Jackie is asking, Jessica did reply too, but maybe if you could expand what the difference between the watercolor pencils and the graphitant pencils Oh yeah, um, the major difference there, actually two differences. Um, so the watercolor pencils that Derwent has, those are like traditional watercolors. Um, they are a little bit, they, are, they aren't quite as vibrant as Inktense and you can kind of manipulate them uh, once they are dry. So they're not as permanent as Inktense. The Graphitin pencils, that, don't quote me on this, I. I want to say it's the same pigments that are in that are used in ink tents, but I, I don't know for sure. I don't think it's a watercolor uh, 
base. But either way, it is a, a pigment, a water soluble pigment, and then there's graphite mixed in with it. Um, yeah, it, it's a, a water soluble graphite um, that's mixed in with color. And I'm yeah. actually going to share a link in here because this is very interesting. Um, if you guys just want to learn about the different types of pencils that Derwent has, Derwent on their site has a choose your pencil and it, mm -hmm. and it gives you a little, little bit about each of the type of pencils. They're fantastic. So it will tell you which ones are wax based or soluble or. I highly it's recommend awesome. all of their water soluble pencils. I use all of them. But that's it. Anything else? I know we're like just at the time. Um, so there was just a question about our pricing offering for Derwent paints right now. We are currently, we have until the end of the month, it's 25% off Derwent paint and pan sets, um, which um, will end September 30th. They might also be in October. I'm just not sure yet. Um, but they're normally at least 20% off list price every day. So we always do give a great price on those. Um, and we can also, we'll share the link in the email we send tomorrow, follow up with the link to the video as well. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Feel free to send me questions if you want to. Thank you guys so much. Wonderful afternoon. Bye, Thank you. everyone. Thank you.